right, well, good morning. We're just a few minutes late, but that's okay. We've been having a pop-up breakfast, as Kelly said. Thank you to David, who made pancakes this morning. Yay! Oh, pancakes done. It's nice to see all the kids this morning. You're ready to play, ready to drum. We would like to welcome you to Sacred Ground. And today is December 18th. It's the week before Christmas. And yay, one week before Christmas. Tonight is the start of Hanukkah. You've probably all heard about that. Uh, the eight days of Hanukkah. And that starts tonight. At, have you heard about Hanukkah? At, at sundown, we'll start tonight. We're going to light the Advent candles, and uh, in fact, I think I might need some help. Who wants to light some candles? Are, are you able to? I'm going to take you right here. Come on up here. And here's. Can you do a lighter? All right. So here's number one, number two, number three would be the purple one, and number four is the pink one. So, yeah. Wait, wait. so this first one, the Advent candle, is representing hope. Put it down. Just light it when it's down. The first candle of the Advent season represents hope. And this is supposed to be the prophecy, the prophesy candle, like Isaiah foretold the birth of Jesus. There you go. All right. And number two would represent faith. This is called the Bethlehem candle. And this represents the journey of Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. And over here would be the third one. This represents joy. And I was talking about the joy of the angels pronouncing the birth of Jesus. And it just filled the shepherds with joy. So we got to tell somebody. So that's what this third candle is, joy. One that almost burned down our church last week. Because <laughs> it fell over. We're going to get it. It's got a little wood. Don't bring your thumb. How about we try to and there's the third represents right now. Oh, there you go. Just light it there. And this represents peace. And this is the angel's candle. So as they said, peace on earth and goodwill to men. And now we will light this one on New on Christmas Eve. Well, we're going to be here as a church on Christmas Eve at five o'clock to five thirty, and we will light this this candle. And we are not going to have a Christmas Day service. So we're going to carol. We're going to be here from 5 o'clock to 5.30. And we're going to sing Christmas carols outside of Noel's Market. Said hello. I'm doing well. Oh, good, good. Oh, good. So their mom's going to come for Christmas carol now. And if you, if you need to go someplace, the Loxton Church is having a service on Christmas Day at 10.30. And also, there is the Christmas dinner at the Parkers if you need a place to go. Would you like to say anything about that? Christmas dinner is at high noon at Parker Ranch. So if you don't have family around and you want to join in our family, you would be more than welcome to do so. And bring, if you want to bring something, bring something that you normally have for Christmas, because we do the turkey and the ham and, and standard stuff. But you uh, can contribute something that makes it home for you. And, and use this opportunity, since we're not going to have a service, use this opportunity. If you have a house full of family, and you think of somebody who might need an invitation, get together with one another. Use this time uh, on Christmas Day for a family time. So, again, uh, I think we're good. Any other announcements besides what's in the bulletin? And thank you, Rebecca. New Year's Eve, we'd like to have a gathering, and we're still trying to figure out the details, but we will have a New Year's Eve service and a Christmas Day service on, on New Year's Day. David?
Hello, good morning, everybody. I just wanted to uh, let everybody know uh, that I had a, a calling, and the calling is to help provide food and meal services for the community, whether you're old or young, and it's also uh, for opening the doors, what we were praying about earlier. So I think that'll be a good way to uh, open the doors and bring people to the church, and uh, people would like to give with me so we can talk about meals and menus. We'll start off with just one day a week, and then we can work from there. Um, I'll leave my phone number on top of the table, and you can call me at your convenience, and then we'll speak to Pastor more about that. David is a good cook. I also want to say that we do have the Lottie Moon uh, Christmas offering. I put the poster up, and we have some envelopes for that, if, if you'd like to contribute to the Lottie Moon offering. And we have our own plate here next to the tambourines. And if you need a bottle of oil for anointing, your own home, then we still have some bottles of oil here. Um, Marie, is, are you here? Would you like to go up and, and pray before we sing?
was approximately 4,000 years. The long-awaited Messiah was coming, and Mary was chosen to be God, by God, to bring him into this world. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And behold, you will conceive in your world and bring forth a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called Son of the Highest. And the, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Luke 1, 28, 31, and 33, 33. Let us rejoice and be joyful that Jesus has come. Amen.
a home of any influence. He was born to a teenage mother, an honorable father, in a dirty, stinky stable with animals. He was laid in the feeding trough with, uh, with dirt, hay, and leftover grain. Jesus, the Son of God, stepped down from heaven and was born into the lowest place. All because he loved us and was willing to sacrifice everything for us. Even though we may be thankful for this year, year all year round, we take this season to honor his birth. <laughs>
even from the beginning, God had a plan. It started with a perfect creation, continued with sin entering the world. And his son being born and later crucified for his sins. But in the end, there, he arose and ascended into heaven to prepare a place for each one of us. Soon, he will return and take us home. What an amazing plan, and what an awesome God we serve. Amen.
that again your glory would shine through this place and through the people and that the peace on earth that you proclaimed and goodwill toward many would be realized, would be known. Your love and your light would be known and that we would wake up, that you would wake up to your goodness and your grace right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's nice that our altar hasn't burned down. <laughs> I think this last week Larry was over here and one of the candles had fallen over and I didn't realize it. And uh, it's kind of like, what were you doing? Reminds me of when I was a kid, I was in a, a wedding once and I was the candle bearer and so I marched up the aisle with my candle lit and it went out right before I got to the candles. And a good friend of ours hopped up with some matches and relit my candle and I was so grateful for him because I didn't know what to do. It's like my light has gone out. But um, I'd like to start this morning's uh, message with 1 Timothy. I'll be reading 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 4. But my message is going to be out of the book of Ruth, of all the places. But 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4, in my Bible it says, Instructions on Worship. And he says, I urge then, first of all, that requests and prayer, intercession and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. And so, Father, we pray that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we have sung about and declared this morning, this Advent season, this time when, when Jesus was born, we pray that that name, Jesus, would be named and lifted up and be made high and exalted as he deserves, as you deserve in Jesus' name. Amen. So it is proper, Paul says, that the testimony be given in its proper time. It is proper that I am here before you today. I, I stand here not in my own strength, as many of you know. And if I did that, it would be useless for me to be up here. Where did I just hear that? God never asks us to do stuff that we can't do. And it's like, no, he does all the time asks us. And so he wants to fill us with his strength. So I stand in the strength that I have. I'm trusting God Almighty who fills me and in fact sends me. So my prayer to the Lord should be, here I am, send me. So in my speaking here, we've been coming through the Bible and I happened to land into Esther today, but I, Ruth, there's two books that are named after women, Ruth and Esther, and thank you for correcting me, you can do that, I give you permission. But I'm looking for Jesus in all, in all of the scripture, and in Genesis, of course, we find that Jesus was there from the very beginning, in the beginning, he helped create. Exodus, Jesus is the Passover lamb, he gave his blood for us. In Leviticus, we see that God is holy, and Jesus makes us holy. There's no way any of us can measure up, but Jesus makes us holy. In Numbers, we serve, like Jesus, humbly. We humbly come before Him. In Deuteronomy, Jesus, who is like lightning Himself, who has eyes of fire, and we prayed that this morning as we gathered around to pray at 9 o'clock, even though we didn't have a physical campfire, it's like, Jesus, You are our light. You are our warmth. And Jesus tells us in Deuteronomy to love God first. And then he says, and love our neighbors like ourselves. In Joshua, we are told not to be afraid and to take that first step into the raging river. Then in Judges, we go in the strength that we have. Gideon says, I'm, a, I'm the least of all these. And, and, and God says, I know, but go in the strength that you have. Jesus gives us that strength. And now we come to Ruth, and the main idea in Ruth is the selfless love. That's what I received out of this. There's only four chapters in Ruth. It's the eighth book of the Bible, and you can turn there if you haven't already. 
It's the story of selfless love. It's a story of contrasts. It's a story of Naomi, who's one of the main characters, and you might think this is kind of odd. Well, God in His mercy showed me that they came from Bethlehem, of all places. Naomi is one of the main characters. Her husband, Elimelech, is from Bethlehem. And they have two sons. But, and get this, because of the moral degeneracy found in this period of the judges, the national disunity and the general foreign oppression, does that sound familiar to today? Because of that, and because of man in general, saying to God, hey God, we got this, we don't need you, we'll figure it out, we don't want you, then God takes his hand of covering and protection off the nation. And guess what? In Bethlehem, there's famine. There's no bread in Bethlehem. And even though Bethlehem means the house of bread, God has taken his hand off and he's saying, okay, famine. So the contrasts we find in this book are from despair, destitution and desperation to eventual happiness, security and hope, and peace and prosperity. So instead of bitter, Naomi is once again pleasant. Instead of her emptiness, she gets full. Instead of her dead and dying, she becomes living. So where is Jesus in the book of Ruth? I believe that he is our kinsman redeemer. If you've heard that term, yeah. you'll know that Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. So turn to Ruth chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. And it's subtitled Naomi and Ruth. It says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. And that's modern day Jordan. The man's name was Elimelech. And I couldn't help but think of the song, uh, In the Jungle, the Mighty Jungle. Aren't they singing Elimelech, Elimelech? You know that? But Emily tells me no, it's like Wamelech or something like that. But I think it's like Elimelech, Elimelech. But that was his name, Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. The names of the two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And they went to Moab because of the famine, and they lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. And after they had lived there about ten years, both Malan and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. And we, when she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared in, to return home from there. So they decided to go back to where the crops were growing again. And the two daughters-in-law started off with Naomi, and one of them ended up turning back. O Oprah, Opar, what was her name? She said she returned to her country, but Ruth said, I'm going to be with you. And she famously says in verse 16, and this is lovely, you can hang on to this as if God was saying to, this to you, Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. And that is a solid commitment. How many know that the Lord will never, ever, ever, ever leave us? So the two of them returned to Bethlehem, where once again the crops were growing. It was harvest time. And it was a different era back then. 
They were gleaning. I don't know if this is where it was established, but the Israelites would grow crops, and the Lord instructed them to leave some of the harvest in the field so that the poor and the disenfranchised could go, could pick up the food and, and live. But they had to go. They had to be willing to work. It was not just going to be handed to them. But Ruth from Moab was willing to go. She was willing to work. And in chapter 2 of Ruth, she says in verse 2, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. And so Naomi said, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvest. And as it turned out, she found herself. I love this. As it turned out, as she went, she found herself. It reminds me of the prodigal son, and we've talked about that this morning. He said he came to his senses. Well, she found herself in the field. And the field belonged to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. And Boaz, the owner of the field, was a nice man. He used to greet his harvesters with, The Lord be with you, and the Lord bless you, they called back. And... Boaz, the owner of the field, noticed Ruth. Who is this woman? He'd said. And he was told her story that she was from Moab. She was a Moabite, not an Israeli, but she was willing to work. Verses 11 through 13, it says, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And 13 says, May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have given me comfort and have spoken kindly to your servant though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. So Boaz was nice. Not only was Ruth kind and selfless to accompany her mother-in-law, but Boaz was nice to them. And Ruth and Naomi, through this act of her going into the fields, they find their provision. And guess what Boaz was finding? The kinsman redeemer, he was finding love. It's like, who is this girl? So what is a kinsman redeemer? Well, in that day, again, everything was about a family, a father, and particularly sons and inheritance. And if there were no sons, unfortunately, a woman could lose everything. Unless the closest relative would step in, marry the widow, and provide a son. And that's where Boaz is called the kinsman redeemer. So according to my NIV notes, a kinsman redeemer, redemption is the key concept. So redeeming what has been maybe lost. Showing kindness is so important, but the kinsman redeemer was responsible for protecting the interest of needy members of the extended family. Example given to provide an heir for a brother who had died, as in this case, Deuteronomy 25. To redeem land that a poor relative had sold outside the family, you'll find that reference in Leviticus 25. Or to redeem a relative who had been sold into slavery. You'll find that in Leviticus 25. And Naomi is encouraged when she hears that the Lord has led Ruth to the fields of a relative who might serve as their kinsman redeemer. And the moment that Naomi realizes that she has awakened hope and this is the crucial point of turning of this story. Have, has anybody seen the sign where I said, wake up, so that's out there? When we wake up, when we realize, what have I been doing? I haven't been following the Lord. It's wake up. Put your hope in the Lord. Wake up, so let's. Wake up, Oregon. Wake up, USA. Wake up, the world. Put your hope in Him. Do what Jesus asks you to do. And what does He ask us to do? To put our hope in Him. Wake up. 
put your hope in him. So they meet in the fields in chapter 2. In chapter 3, they go to the threshing floor. Naomi's awakened hope now moves her, and Ruth was instructed to prepare herself like a bride. And you don't have to turn there, but to prepare yourself like a bride, it says in Ezekiel 16, get this. The scripture says, I bathed you with water and washed the blood from you and put ointment on you. I clothed you with an embroidered dress and put leather sandals on you. I dressed you in fine linen and covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arms and a necklace around your neck and I put a ring on your nose, earrings on your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Chapter 3 of Ruth, verse 3, Naomi tells Ruth, Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, know the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, so she was maybe trying to be stealthy because I don't think women were supposed to be on the threshing floor. And it was traditional that the owner of the field, when they were winnowing the grain, he would go sleep on the pile of grain so that it wouldn't be stolen. But Naomi tells her to put on perfume and put on your best clothes and go lay by his feet. So she wanted to be stealthy, but she also wanted to be noticed, right? Most men would say, hmm, what's that smell? What's that beautiful smell? And, and Jesus is like that too, except when he said to the Jewish people before Abraham was, I am, they picked up rocks to stone him. And it says that Jesus hid himself because he wasn't ready to go to the cross yet and he escaped from the grasp. So he could hit, hide himself, but in this case, Ruth didn't really want to hide herself. She laid down at Boaz's feet. And they both waited on the Lord. They were proper about their relationship. They waited on the Lord until the matter was settled. And in chapter 4, the matter gets settled. They get married. Boaz marries Ruth. He conducts business in the presence of ten witnesses at the city gate. The real king, kinsman redeemer, as there was a closer relative than Boaz, had the first right to redeem this situation, but he refused. He says, no, nah, I might risk my existing empire, if you will. Go ahead, Boaz. So Boaz, in his kindness and generosity toward these two widows, became the kinsman redeemer, and they were married. And from this relationship, and here's where God has mercy on me, this relationship bears a child. And the child's name was Obed. So Naomi, in a sense, has a son. Obed bears Jesse. Jesse bears David. And ultimately, this royal line bears Jesus in Bethlehem. So there's the connection. Praise the Lord. God is so merciful and He does grant His providence and He sends us where He says to go, we need to go. And I'm thinking about this story and I'm, I'm thinking about coming to the feet of Jesus. And we oftentimes are emptied through our circumstance. We are hungry but he promises that he will fill us. It's his divine providence that he provides. We must ask like we were doing this morning in prayer, and he will give. Jesus is our redeemer, our kinsman redeemer. We must be kind to each other, and we must be selfless. It's hard to do, because the natural thing is to be selfish, but we must be selfish and we must be willing to go. And I was thinking if, if we were drawn close enough and we are drawn, if we go close enough to God and he says, whatever you will ask, 
that's what I will do. James started out his message last week with a passage from Ruth that says, whatever you ask of me, my daughter, I will grant you. And doesn't God do that with us? And what would our response be? If God came to you like he came to Solomon in a dream, Solomon, David's son, and he said, whatever you ask, I will give you. Oh, gosh, give me barrels full of gold. Give me this. Make me the king of the earth. No, he didn't say that. Solomon said, give me wisdom. I feel like I'm a child. Grant me wisdom that I can judge rightly. In Psalm 2, it says, ask for the nations as your inheritance. So when God says, what do you want? Shouldn't our response be, we want people to be saved. We don't want to just lock the doors and say, now we got ours, you can't come in. We want to extend our love and God's love. And of Bethlehem, it says in Micah 5.2, but you, Bethlehem of Ephrathah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be a ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. And remember Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus from the beginning. In Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, it says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. And I say amen to that. And as I concluded this study, and I have little references, I saw a reference to Amos, 9-11, and I'm thinking, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what that is. Amos 9-1-1, 9-11. And as I turn there, Amos, which is, uh, actually, I put a, a note in there, so it's toward the end of the Old Testament. You don't have to go there. But 11 through 15, it says this, Israel's restoration. In that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places and restore its ruins and build it as it used to be so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. I will bring back my exiled people, Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord. And I think that's this day. You know, Israel is under attack a lot. They have a lot of enemies. And I'm just wondering if there's a full-fledged attack and Israel is able to repel that with their mighty army, do you think they might have a tendency to say, look what we did. We defended them. And God yet says, I will defend my people. I think we're looking for God to raise up and do something very, very mighty. Maybe even in the immediate future. I don't know. But we want to ask the Lord, Heavenly Father, we ask, if we were to come to you like Ruth came to Boaz to uncover your feet and say, extend your blanket of protection over us, we, we ask for that, but we also ask for the nations, Lord. We don't ask for our own selfishness. We want to ask according to your purpose and according to your will. Lord, we pray that hearts would turn, that hearts would be softened, that you, by your Holy Spirit, would draw all men to Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Lord. And that people would be saved. That Celeste would be saved. That Oregon, that Lincoln County would be saved. That Oregon would be saved. That America would be saved. That we would turn to you. We would be on our knees and turn to you with our hands lifted high and to praise you. And we ask this mighty thing in Jesus' name.
And let me end with, again, what I started off this message from 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. He says, I urge you then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. Amen? Amen. So, if you need prayer of any kind, there are plenty of people here who would love to pray with you. I, I think we're all friendly folks this morning. And uh, as I've prayed, I ask for hearts to be softened. I ask that we would be effective. I thank you for the kids, Father, that are here this morning. And I pray for our communities that our lights would shine and that we would draw, we would help you and work with you to draw all men to yourself. In the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. I think we are done. God bless you guys. Thank you all for being here.